record on this computer, share screen, All right, uh, welcome. We have a Beginners Academy presentation tonight. It's called 21 Things to Do After You Get Your Amateur Radio License. And uh, uh, I didn't come up with the 21 things. There's a book by Dan Romanchik, Roma uh, KB6NU, and um, we are uh, providing this book to uh, uh, new hams and returning hams. Um, and uh, <clears throat> uh, we're borrowing from uh, Dan's book and uh, that's with permission. Uh, we're going to attempt to do a little uh, video, uh, a little summary of uh, uh, what's exciting about ham radio and it lasts about six minutes so Uh, no audio, Greg. <laughs> Greg, we don't have any audio. You don't hear any audio? No, I don't. Yeah, I'm not getting any either. Yeah, no oh, audio. Okay. Yeah, no audio. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I thought we was honing our lip reading skills. <laughs> well, uh, that didn't turn out as planned, but um, uh, you'll notice that they're all uh, young people uh, from the UK. It's actually a well done video and it's better with sound. <laughs> and, uh, Okay, well, uh, <clears throat> uh, the first uh, thing of the 21 things is to join a club. And um, uh, in Panama City, it's the Panama City Amateur Radio Club. And uh, new hams that test with us or who become hams, um, uh, they get uh, a free uh, membership until the end of the year. And uh, the Panama City Amateur Radio Club's been around a long time. Uh, we're fortunate to have a nice clubhouse. We have radios. We have uh, about uh, 70 members. Uh, and uh, we have a, a lots of uh, mentors. And we have a lot of fun. And we'll touch on more of that as we go through. Um, and um, <clears throat> uh, so we'll uh, continue on to the next. Uh, does anybody have anything they'd like to say about our club before we move on? Where do you get the patches at? Because that's pretty cool. And I just got my ID card in the mail because I renewed my membership. Right. Well, came in the mail uh, today. 
Uh, Jack, do you have an answer about patches? Jack may have to turn his microphone on. Yeah, can you hear me? I hear you. Um, we don't have any patches. Okay. <laughs> um, there's some that are hanging on a wall at the clubhouse. And uh, my son designed those and uh, made them himself. Um, I don't know if he can custom build any, you know, uh, a request or not, but uh, I can ask him if he'll, uh, if he's interested in doing that. I just, I was going to, I think it's pretty cool looking. I'm just going to put it on my uh, motorcycle riding vest. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, that was the original patch that you see uh, on the screen right now. Yeah, like I, like I said, there's about five different ones that uh, my son kind of uh, you know, made up for uh, approval, and we've never even discussed it yet. So I think that looks pretty cool, but all right. <clears throat> well, Jack, while you're there, how do people join our club? All they have to do is fill out an application and uh, give us $20, $30 for a family membership. Right. Okay. Uh, Jack is our treasurer, by the way. And the uh, photo, the group photo in the middle uh, was from um, uh, portable operating at a uh, the Cape San Blas uh, lighthouse, uh, which is actually in Port St. Joe. But uh, we had a great time out there uh, with multiple stations and uh, made a lot of contacts. And over on the right uh, is uh, just a glimpse of field day, uh, putting up a portable tower um, in the parking lot of, uh, of the Bay County EOC. And uh, field day is one of those big activities for the club each year. All right, so, uh, so hopefully you'll check number one off your list, join a club. Uh, next on Dan's list is join ARRL. Uh, ARRL has been around practically as long as there's been ham radio. Uh, Hiram Percy Maxim uh, founded it uh, probably in the 30s. Could be the 20s, but uh, uh, it's been around a long time. It's a national organization and um, it uh, uh, advocates for us hams as a group, uh, particularly where uh, our spectrum, all the bands that we're able to use are very nice, but, but other uh, enterprises uh, may would like, might want to get our spectrum. So we have to have a good case to keep it. Uh, the best way to keep it is to use it. So there's about 20 or more amateur bands that you can get on. Uh, the ARRL uh, publishes uh, uh, a magazine um, uh, that covers general topics for amateur radio. It's called QST. And uh, QST is a Q code for a message to all amateurs. Um, in the middle is their uh, logo. And the headquarters for ARRL is in Newington, Connecticut. Uh, they have a um, big station there. And uh, they originate code practice. Um, that's Morse code over the air uh, on um, uh, many of the bands. And uh, you can tune that in with a short wave receiver, SDR, or, or your rig, whatever you have. Um, <clears throat> so uh, do we have any members of the ARRL with us? Oh, yeah. I'm a lifetime member. Oh, awesome. And, and I have plenty of back issues if anyone would like to have one. Right. Well, the... Uh, one or more. One or many. 
There's a bunch of them at the clubhouse also. There is also, right. yeah, a bunch well, of them. Uh, there is as many ads as there is content in the QST. So you're going to see uh, all the vendors, uh, manufacturers uh, put an ad in there. And um, so there's technical articles, uh, uh, reports on uh, contest results, and too many things for us to cover here tonight. But, uh, Greg, Greg, is, Greg is also available online, I believe. If you get the online version, it's a little cheaper than the paper version. Well, uh, right. And actually, uh, they have uh, this magazine and QEX. Uh, actually, you can get the Experimenters magazine is uh, available online, as is uh, QST when you join. So there's more options than there used to be for getting to the material. And the uh, Canadian version is called RAC. R-A-C. Put them on the rack. That's right. <laughs> Radio Amateurs of Canada, which is affiliated with ARRL. Yeah. Our uh, magazine is called the TCA. Awesome. There you have it. <laughs> In case uh, you want to move north, well, there you go. <laughs> The magazine is um, not too expensive. I guess forty something dollars. Well, you're getting more than that magazine. You're joining the organization, but um, there's much more going on at ARRL. Uh, but um, so that's number two in the twenty-one things. Uh, number three is find the Elmer. So, uh, does anybody know what an Elmer looks like? Looks like you. <laughs> well, uh, I read a little book about ham radio, and it said that an Elmer has nothing to do with Elmer Fudd. But it, and then about a paragraph later, it said, "Well, your first Elmer will look like Elmer Fudd, so or Herman Munster. It's going to be one or the other." But a better word than Elmer is a mentor. And uh, even better word than mentor is friend. So in amateur radio, you can find Elmer's mentors and friends and um, uh, uh, they can help you get over, they can't do everything for you, but uh, they can um, uh, help you get get started, get over some of the rough points, uh, help you learn something new. Uh, uh, we have Chris, VA3ECO, and he's a great mentor, and he helped me with uh, amateur satellites. And uh, uh, I sure, certainly wouldn't have gotten there without Chris coming all the way down from Canada to help me out. I think we kind of worked together as a team more. <laughs> so, avoiding a war. And yeah. also, I, I know Greg doesn't toot his own horn, but Greg was responsible for many of us getting on the uh, FM satellites, including myself. Well, thank you, Jim. Yep. So, um, uh, uh, I was looking at the QST. They're 100 years old. 1920, first issue. Yeah, you can go back to the early issues. Uh, well, uh, mm. the funny thing is, you don't have to be an amateur radio very long to be a El Elmer. Uh, uh, Ashley's uh, an Elmer already, and as is George, and and uh, Ryan will be one tomorrow. So, <laughs> so Not we're all, all beginners, and and most of us are are Elmers or mentors. I'm more like Herman, scared to death. <laughs> right. <laughs> so our club is a resource for Elmers, and uh, through Zoom here, you'll get familiar with some of the members of the club, and and on um, about every other uh, Zoom meeting, we just open things up for questions, and uh, so 
anytime you do have a question, just just shout out. All right, next on the list is buy a radio. Uh, a lot of uh, new hams, uh, particularly, they've gotten their technician license and they go get an HT as their first radio, uh, which is fine. Just make sure it's not your last radio because the uh, capabilities of HT are kind of limited. Um, uh, a mobile rig might be a choice for VHF. Uh, um, so there's lots of choices you might want to ask around. And Ashley, what, what do you think about the bow thing as a choice for a new ham? Well, <clears throat> it was my first one. And I really liked the bow thing. Uh, I got, what, three of them now. One's out on loan to my neighbor and friend that just got his license. But I bought a uh, radio identity, not a uh, eight watt, 10, uh, 10 watt. And I haven't got to play with it very much, but uh, for your first radio, the Bofang is uh, a very good little unit. Uh, I can use it a little bit better sometimes out here in my driveway, but it depends on where you stand. Right. But I have a, matter of fact, I have that UV5R unit in my big truck with a magnetic mount antenna outside up on a CB antenna mount. And uh, it does pretty good. You cross the inlet bridge and get over into uh, Santa Rosa Beach. Then I switch over to the Crestview repeater, and I can hear Sarnet all the way up to toward Pensacola. Right. On that little uh, UV5R. Yeah, the one the one on the left there, the UV5R, I use one of those for, uh, for satellite. Works very well. Yeah, I have a – I like them. I, I, I just – Actually, I think I like them better than this radio diddity I got. That's a more has more watts to it, but uh, uh, I like these better. Yeah, when they first came out, I signed up as one of their dealers, and I probably sold about five hundred of those over the years. And uh, I think maybe I had two complaints. Well, then I got a, wow. I got a the kit was like a thirty-five or forty dollar. And it came with the what you see right there plus a spare battery. So you get two batteries with it. They yeah, last probably, the batteries and a speaker, speaker mic too, right? Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, it yeah. came with the microphone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah well, I, I used to sell that kit, yeah. Anyway, well, uh, uh, I hooked <clears throat> you know, I hooked it up to a magnetic mount on my big truck. I took that little lanyard tab off of it. Uh but I like the fact that it's got the two batteries to it. But I also have a battery eliminator on it in the big truck hooked up to the cigarette lighter. So I don't have to worry about charging batteries. So I have like three spare batteries laying over here uh, if I ever have to go mobile with all the different Bofangs. Do you have the big high capacity battery? No, just the regular size. Oh, okay. Because they make one twice the size of that, you know. Yeah. I have a, I carry. Uh, another one in my Jeep, so I can monitor four channels in my Jeep. So I got a battery eliminator on it as well. And I have yeah, that's, the, that's the best way to go with the eliminator. That, that, that heavy duty battery is like $22. It's ridiculous. Right. And yeah. uh, <coughs> I just, I don't know. I have nothing but nice things to say about those bow things right now. Just They're just a great little radio. For being a little, it's a probably what a three and a half, maybe four watt radio. But they get the job done even and but the one complaint that I have about it, if you don't use the little rubber duck antenna that comes with it, it's narrowly not gonna work. Yeah, but the, the antenna that's included with it is actually a pretty good antenna. It is. It, and I have better luck with that than I do the bigger antennas. However, I do have the little feeder cable to go from the SMA to the PL two fifty nine hook up to the bag mount that's outside the truck and it does a very good job oh yeah that'd be a I'd make a great mobile yeah it, it it's working very well i think i saw them on amazon for like 24.95 shipped 
the single radio, what you see right there is about $24. Yep. Yeah. Tw twenty four ninety five on Amazon now. Thank you. That little kit right there does not come with the microphone. <laughs> yeah, it's like another $5. Yeah. Uh, they, have right. watt. they have one that looks exactly like that. It's eight watts. It's, so it's about 40 bucks. Yeah. Well, all these topics uh, we can actually have a presentation on. And uh, so we welcome that. Uh, buying your first radio. I think Phil uh, covered some radios and uh, so we'll, we'll come around to that. Um, so that, you know, you're the chief engineer of your station and, and, and uh, but you may want to ask Elmers about uh, what, you know, what your options are. Uh, over on the right is a uh, HF radio that's very popular. It's not the only radio you can get, but it's reasonably priced for what you get, uh, even new, and it has many uh, awesome capabilities. But um, you don't have to buy new, and if you're around the club for a while uh, or ask around, there may be an opportunity for a loaner radio or uh, a used radio uh, to get on the air with. Right, right. One more side note about the bow thing. <laughs> I, I don't want to get Go ahead. Really easy program with the chirp program. Right. So to the new hams, it's that, that radio is very easy to program. It's a dual band. So you can look, but the, through the chirp, it's it's very very easy so it's not a cumbersome radio and i don't know about the other one right here the icom i guess that's a you just gotta dial that one in it looks like well it has similar software uh so same idea um and we're the, going uh, i was gonna say the uh the yeah, going through Chirp, um, like Ash just said, is fine for the radio. It works fine. Um, but the menus on the radio itself aren't necessarily very intuitive. I, uh, I had to play with mine recently, and I picked it up last night. I was just trying to alter this squelch, and I accidentally factory reset it instead because the menus, <laughs> frankly, are not that straightforward. And then, then, the, then the radio was speaking Chinese to me after that. <laughs> yeah. Well, is a, a new ham... Yeah. Uh, with a HT for VHF, you'll want to get on our repeater, and you'll need to uh, program it either, even either by uh, punching the buttons on the radio or using software. And software is really the way to go. And we're going to move on to getting on the air. And I was very pleased to hear Ryan on the air. Uh, checking into the round table tonight. And uh, so Ryan uh, uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't have mic fright. So, but for some people uh, getting on the air or getting on the repeater uh, is intimidating. So uh, we don't want you to trip up on that step. Um, and uh, so, uh, <clears throat> encourage you to get on the air one way or the other, uh, press that button, and you'll uh, generally have some friendly folks to uh, converse with, and, um, and you can um, press the button and, and ask for a radio check and maybe start a conversation. Uh, there are many, well, amateur radio has so many ways to get on the air. Um, both VHF, HF, and something that's really popular now is uh, FT8. Uh, and on FT8, you don't have to say anything. It's basically uh, your information is put into the program and you receive information from other hams uh, and it can be really all over the world. Uh, George has really embraced FTA. And uh, do you have something to add to that, George? 
No, um, yeah, FTA, it's, it's something you can get into pretty quickly. It's a little bit of research getting things set up, but, but once you're set up, it's, it's pretty easy to use. Um, then yeah, and there, there's FT4 as well and the other digital modes, like you know, there's Olivia and RTCY and so forth. That mostly does just, uh, FTA and FT4, but there are other modes as well. And yeah. um, I, I find it interesting and you don't have to wear out your voice. You just send make hundreds of contacts uh, digitally but by pressing a few buttons, it's, it's fairly easy. Right. Uh, and that, it's an example, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, six, seven years ago, uh, there wasn't FT8. So it's one of the new mood, new modes, and it's just kind of taken over. Uh, but there's still uh, uh, voice uh, is a lot of fun. Uh, single sideband, also um, uh, CW, uh, Morse code is uh, very much alive and well. And so uh, you have a lot of choices, but you have a license um, and uh, one of your steps will be getting on the air. Uh, next on the list is set up a shack. Uh, your shack could be your car. <laughs> it, could, it could be a park or it could be an uh, area in your home. And uh, actually, uh, just uh, a single radio, uh, as you see on the left, uh, really doesn't take up a whole lot of space. But if something happens to your brain and you begin collecting radios, you may end up like the gentleman on the right. <laughs> I think I worked him one time. He's up, in, yeah. he's up on some island up in uh, Lake Michigan, I think. Yeah. Well, I thought that was Jim's house. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's where he got the idea from. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's Greg's house. <laughs> well, my house is just a pile of stuff. So this guy, this gentleman's got it organized. <laughs> so, um, uh, but, um, uh, um, uh, so, you know, you get to start uh, building your shack. Uh, uh, a real challenge these days are the antennas to go along with your radio that's on, inside your house. It's a challenge to get from the inside to the outside with coax. And you may be in a HOA, homeowner association or deeds and covenants and uh, but uh, that doesn't mean that it's game over. Uh, uh, several of our uh, newcomers have, um, uh, have uh, come up with ways to get on the air. <laughs> and that's Susie singing. Uh, sometimes it's your own family may object. Uh, your wife may object <laughs> to Ann. Or your dog. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, um, what's the secret, George, to to you know getting past uh, any roadblocks like that? You ask me. I'm, I'm still trying to work that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know my my, uh, my wife didn't have any issue with it, you know setting up radios and so forth. The issue was she didn't want a large antenna outside for everyone to see. Um, and you know, so I started with smaller antennas that she was okay with, and then. Fortunately, actually, at, at field day last year, she saw yours, um, your, your NFED, and she well, it's not as bad as I thought it was going to be. It's kind of what she said. I'm like, well, okay, I'll take that as a sign. I can go get one. So and now I have one in my backyard. That's right. You just, just work up to it a little bit, I guess. Uh, that, well, that's how I did mine. Hopefully, my wife isn't listening, yeah, so, so I can use that trick again. It's a matter of time, and I know I – took my wife to a rocket launch she, she said why is why isn't your rocket as big as his rocket you know so you know <laughs> sometimes <laughs> your peers can help you out uh, there. That, uh, when you when you live like in a community like I do a townhome community and all that there's the rules know what the rules are that way you're in competition with the rules 
That's why you push that envelope a little bit. Right. And then you just play stupid. Well, actually, uh, there's a lot of articles about getting on in either uh, small lots or HOA situations. So there is an answer. You just may have to work on that problem for a while. Paint the color of the house and mount it on the side of the house against the wall. They won't know it. That's right. Stealth <laughs> antenna. That's what I did. All right. Uh, next is buy some tools. Uh, so uh, amateur radio operator uh, may uh, need to solder a connector or uh, uh, build a kit. And uh, you may already have tools, but it may be an excuse to get a soldering iron or a soldering station, uh, your choice. Um, and uh, so most guys have lots of tools. You just may want to get some that are, can help you with your uh, amateur radio. And one key thing, if you don't already have one, is a DVM, which is a digital voltmeter which will measure voltage, uh, measure resistance, and it can also measure current. And this particular one you'll find at Harbor Freight, and sometimes they give it away, I think. I don't know. <laughs> so, um, uh, Chris, do you have a Simpson uh, VOM or, or, or voltmeter? <laughs> I have a triplet. Okay, which a is triplet. just after the triplet is just after the Simpson. I have worked with Simpsons, but uh, you know, when the mill shut down, I should have grabbed one out of the cover and taken it home. I was stupid. Yeah. <laughs> well, the good news is uh, a digital vote meter, uh, like the bow thing, is it you can get one that's not very expensive. If, if you want to go for accuracy or uh, ruggedness or something else there's there's more expensive models you may want to look at uh next uh build an antenna uh antennas are one of the most uh, fun parts of amateur radio uh particularly you may not build your rig but you can build your antenna and we have two uh, examples uh, here, uh, the one on the left is uh, it's known as a ground plane for um, two meters, and it's uh, built on a uh, PL59 uh, uh, connector, and you'll see instructions for these on the web. And actually, this is, I've been trying to tell you, Normally they have uh, four radials, but in a tight you can have two radials. So you could hang this in a window with two radials pretty easily and uh, maybe get out of your uh, condo uh, with that. Well, uh, you gave me a, a good idea about the coax, just stripping it down, you know, 19 and a half yeah. inch, whatever, and then hanging it up at an upstairs window so I can do that from the inside. Uh, but right. they are double, double pane storm windows with a film in between them. So I might have some issues with that. Yeah. I did, yeah. Build, I did build something like that once and it just didn't work. I could not even hit the club repeater with that. Okay. What's, have you got a stucco wall there, Ashley? Uh, no, it's a uh, uh, siding, uh, not this, it's a, uh, like board siding. So there's no wire mesh in it. You might want to put it a foot beside the window. It'd be better going through the wood than it would be going through the glass. Yeah. If it's got a low E coating, that stuff can mess up the higher frequencies pretty yeah. badly. Yeah. The old windows were no sweat, but the new windows are not good. Yeah. And uh, I first thought that the, the, the windows, but they're not aluminum either. They're a, a vinyl. So that's a plus yeah. on my side. But that film and yeah. going between Double pane glass is really messing me up. Yeah, try beside the window, probably work fine, and just move it along until you hit it nice. My J pole right now that I put up, I take it up and take it down, uh, is working very well. 
But right now, too, they're, they're finally, two years later, putting roofs on our building after the hurricane. And mine's the next one. So the next week and a half is going to be very difficult. I got to take mm. the antenna, <laughs> put it up at night, work it, and then take, bring it back inside. Right. And in fact, it's hanging in the ceiling right now uh, out of the way for them to come scrape the roof. Yeah. Another thing you can use indoors is uh, a J-pole, but there's a roll-up version uh, uh, that you can roll up, but when you need it, you can un unroll it, but you can hang it on your wall like Chris was talking about. Right. And I've done that uh, and hit the repeater really no problem. But Ashley, you live in an area where... <laughs> Oh, Where I think on receive, it's it's tough, but it yeah. is. I can, I get out. I can use my handheld and get out, and then everybody can hear me, but I can't hear them. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, everybody goes, "Well, we try to get back to you." I go, well, "I didn't hear anything." It's I get so much interference from uh, the parkway, which is a quarter of a mile through the woods right there, that uh, it's causes me a lot of grief. But that J pole does a good job. I just have to raise it to get to the club repeater. I got to raise it an extra 18 inches, which I came up with a plan to do that, but I can hit the Sarnet and the, and the 330 machine on the lower side of it. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, we'll just briefly, the antenna on the right is a dipole. Uh, it is basically two wires. Uh, of a particular length, uh, they say a half wavelength, but the formula for that, for a wire dipole is 468 over the frequency of megahertz. So for, um, um, for uh, 40 meters, I believe it's about 33 feet. Um, we won't go into all the details, but uh, this can be built out of materials that you can get at um, Home Depot. Uh, you can use PVC for an insulator. Um, uh, it's fed with coax in this case. And um, so get together some wire, uh, something for insulators, coax, and hook it up to your radio. Uh, I recommend building a dipole and uh, tuning it uh, because once you understand the dipole, you'll understand a whole lot of other antennas. And George put built a fan dipole in his attic, which which was uh, a challenge, but uh, uh, so uh, particularly when you get on HF. Uh, build a dipole and you can quickly get on the air. Uh, speaking of building, uh, uh, <clears throat> it's a good idea uh, to build kits, uh, to learn to solder, um, and there's a lot of uh, kits that aren't too complicated that you can start with. Uh, the one on the left is uh, a dummy load with a bunch of uh, resistors and a circuit board here. Uh, on the right is a code practice oscillator. And um, uh, you can also build your radio. In particular, there's a radio uh, kit out. Uh, it's the QCX. Uh, which I believe is less than $50. And uh, uh, it may not be the best first kit to build, but as you build your skills, you can, you can work up to building uh, uh, kit radios. Uh, most of them are low power, uh, but uh, nevertheless, they're a lot of fun. Uh, does anybody else have a, a kit to suggest or to get started with? I'm not hearing anything. Uh, I don't have it to show, but uh, 
I built several QRP radios and uh, they pretty much worked right off the bat and I still use them. All right, uh, this is a pre-COVID photo of a, of a ham fest, uh, which uh, is a gathering of hams. Uh, 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 there's uh, used equipment for sale, new equipment for sale, vendors to talk to, organizations to talk to, friends to talk to, and uh, new friends to make uh, at a ham fest. And this is one of the most fun activities in amateur radio. Not everybody likes a ham fest. Not everybody likes the crowd. <laughs> but unfortunately, uh, many of our Practically all the ham fest have been put on hold till we get on the other side of this COVID. But uh, I'm waiting to see for the Orlando ham fest, which is a big ham fest. Uh, Phil, are you with us? Yeah, I'm here. Can you tell us about some local ham fests that were, that that are in Northwest Florida? The uh, Fort Walton is coming up in November. Uh, I think it's. Uh, November 13th, Friday afternoon, and then uh, the next day, November 14th, uh, Saturday morning from like 9 to 12 or 9 to 1, and they're giving away so, a couple of pretty nice radios, so uh, uh, it would be worth it uh, just for that, yeah. but, uh, uh, and I'm thinking since there hasn't been that many this year, I'm thinking there's going to be a, probably a pretty big crowd there. Right. Uh, but, uh, and that's the closest one. And I think um, Melbourne, maybe, uh, let's see, Montgomery is also in November. I think they're still having theirs. Uh, Jim knows more, really know more, knows more about when the ham fest are than I do. Uh -huh. It goes to a lot more of them than I do. Yeah, yeah Melbourne's this next weekend. Okay. Are they going to have it? Yes, they are. Okay. Well, uh, several. It's, a, it's, a, it's a Friday, Saturday, I'm guessing. Yeah, braving it and having them anyway. Yep. Yeah, well, two of the big ham fests in the South is Orlando in February. And in August, there's the Huntsville Ham Fest. And even though it's in the summer, uh, it's all indoors. And... Uh, it's the world's friendliest ham fest. It's a lot of fun. So I hope these come back and uh, that you'll get to experience that. Uh, Phil, tell us what a tailgate is. A tailgate is, uh, we have them down at the club. It's when uh, people bring their uh, equipment and set up out in the parking lot or in the field behind the club and with their pickup trucks and with their equipment sitting on the tailgate and, uh, or they can sit on the tailgate themselves and everybody uh, socializes and you might sell a radio, you might buy a radio, uh, but you'll probably end up eating a, a hamburger and, uh, and socializing. That's what we do more than anything. And uh, usually there's testing uh, Gary does testing and uh, the uh, club station is open and uh, people can operate it and uh, it's usually, uh, it's a lot of fun. Yep, so it's a miniature ham fest. It's a miniature ham fest, yes. That's right. With more socialization <laughs> emphasis yeah. probably. Yeah, well, they're awesome and, um, you know, sometimes you'll find some gear. Uh, uh, you, fairly inexpensive. Yeah. 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 All right. Uh, next, uh, learn the lingo. Um, well, the lingo on the left is for uh, Morris code or CW operation. Um, but you'll hear the terms even on phone. Uh, uh, some people say you don't need to use them on phone, but you'll probably hear uh, QRM for interference, uh, 
um, or uh, <clears throat> I'm going to QSY, which is change frequency. And uh, QSL means all received. And obviously a QSO is, well, it's not obvious, but it's a contact. So um, I think, uh, so anyway, uh, particularly if you're going to learn Morse code and get on the air, you'll want to learn the Q codes and also a lot of the abbreviations. Uh, uh, so you don't have to send as many characters to get the point across. Uh, over on the right is the NATO phonetic alphabet. And uh, it's very handy for uh, uh, getting your call sign uh, across the bands or to the guy you're, or gal that you're talking to. For example, my call sign is November 4 Kilo Golf Lima. Uh, the club call sign is Whiskey 4 Romeo Yankee Zulu. And uh, so, uh, Ryan, uh, what's yours? <laughs> so. Oh man, mine is, uh, mine is Kilo Oscar 4 uh, Hotel X Ray Sierra. Awesome. Oh, that's pretty easy. Uh, you can make up a cute, something cute for your call. Not everybody likes that, but you can do it. Not for Ryan's call. I don't know anything cute for Ryan's call. <laughs> that, would be a that would be a trick. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you can love your call and keep it your whole ham uh, experience. Or you can get a vanity call uh, from call signs that are available. Uh, and the FCC has a process for uh, requesting a vanity call. Or they'll, when you upgrade, you can also ask for a new call in the sequence. But uh, a lot of people will um, go for vanity calls and uh, and get a vanity tag with their call sign on it. So, but uh, as far as lingo, uh, there is a lot of lingo. Um, uh, does anybody want to explain what XYL is? Significant other. Go well, ahead. Y YL is young lady, so take it from there. <laughs> <laughs> You want to be very careful about who is listening, but but anyway, it's common. You know, we may have to change all these things. You know, uh, society's changing. But anyway, ex young lady, and uh, there's just oodles of that. But don't be intimidated. Uh, you can look them up or ask ask a ham friend uh, uh, what they're talking about. Uh, it does in, in, intimidate, uh, you know, people that maybe haven't been into radio. Uh, uh, it, it is a little intimidating, but, but you can get past all that. Uh, next, you can, if you like, subscribe to mailing list. Beginners Academy has an email list, uh, blogs and podcasts. Uh, uh, there's so many hams that love to share and uh, there's some very well produced uh, 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 audio podcast and video podcast one that's very famous is Ham Nation with Bob Heil and his friends um, if you're a new ham um, there's one you, there's also a lot of content on YouTube, and there's uh, a uh, ham that does something called Ham Radio Crash Course, and he really covers a lot of beginner topics, and so his uh, uh, talks are in interviews and uh, are on YouTube. 
So um, you don't have to search very far to start finding these things. Uh, there's also blogs, um, a websites, and uh, uh, the one on the right is uh, the fellow who came up with the 21 things, Dan Romanchik, or Romanchik, and uh, so anyway, it's a way to pass information and experiences, and who knows, you may do your own blog or uh, take advantage of uh, others there. But uh, with uh, smartphones and all the media we have, uh, uh, it's not hard to run across these. And uh, another good one, a couple of good ones is uh, Ham Radio Workbench is an audio podcast. And my favorite of all is, uh, is uh, QSO Today. Uh, by Eric Guth. And I failed to mention on HamFest that since we couldn't get together physically during this COVID thing, that a number of HamFest have been done virtually. And uh, uh, QSO today had a virtual HamFest uh, that had about 60 speakers and it had vendors and that material is still online. So if you go to the QSO Today webpage, there'll be a link to get you into the virtual ham fest. Uh, does anybody have a blog or webpage or uh, podcast they'd like to highlight? To I might try KK4DIV on YouTube. He's got some pretty good uh, uh, YouTube presentations. And um, uh, Bob KK4DIV is our uh, our secretary in the club. Uh, he enjoys operating outside and setting up his equipment and putting them in go boxes and so you you can learn a lot from Bob. So thanks Jack for mentioning that. Uh, Ryan, have you listened to any amateur radio podcast or YouTube's? Yeah, I, uh, I definitely have listened to a lot of the uh, ham radio crash course stuff. Uh, it's it's pretty accessible to new people. Um, a couple more um, kind of heady or uh, technical ones that I've followed on YouTube um, that I would throw out there. Uh, one is the signal path. Um, I'm not an electrical engineer. He is. And so when it comes to questions on, uh, on different things that are pretty technical, I, I like uh, his, his channel for that. Uh, and another one is uh, W2AEW on YouTube. Right. And he's another uh, electrical guy. I don't know if you guys are familiar with him, but he's a ham guy as yes. well. So um, he's got some good stuff as well. <laughs> well, there's a whole lot of, uh, there's so much, uh, to talk about in ham radio <laughs> and you have access to some of the you know some of the experts um, um, so you can go for it uh, try to satisfy your technical curiosity there uh, next uh, don't stop with your technician uh, 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 study up and upgrade to general, or take your technician in general on the same day <laughs> and get it over with. But um, a technician is fine, um, but you can pretty much have access to all aspects of amateur radio once you go for your general. And uh, and obviously, when you get your general, you can go for your extra. But it's kind of the same uh, process of studying. Uh, there's so much. There's books and websites and uh, things to take advantage of. And also, if there's some sticky points, uh, uh, you can talk to your Elmer or mentor about those. I got a question about going from you know, I'm just a technician. I got a question if I were to do the general, 
do you have to answer the same questions for technician and then the extra 35 for general or is it a whole new different batch of questions uh, it's a different batch uh, Gary would you answer that please yeah, each license class has its own question pool so the technician has a uh, question pool and a 35 question test <clears throat> general has a, a different question pool and a, uh, a 35 question test there is a lot of overlap of the subjects between technician and general but the questions are different I just I thought there'd be a little bit of overlap. I was just curious about that. I probably should have tried to do that, but uh, I was lucky to get what I got. <laughs> well, study. You'll right. surprise yourself. Huh? Study. You will surprise yourself. Oh, I know. I've already forgot most of it. <laughs> and fortunately, even though uh, we're still in the midst of COVID, uh, we found a way at the club, thanks to Gary, to test, and you can you can um, uh, test the, on Wednesday, the third Wednesday of the month uh, by appointment or other times if you make special arrangements. So um, we need to recover <laughs> for, for not having tests. Uh, uh, some groups have come up with ways to do remote testing but uh, it's really better doing it in person because you you get to meet people in the local club uh, just through the testing process and you get a book. Yeah, so, and the book is 21 things, <laughs> so, which has more detail than what we're covering. Uh, and don't let your license expire. I know this from personal experience. So uh, I took a 25 year break from amateur radio. So, so I had to take all three tests over, but actually it was good because things had changed in 25 years and I had that helped ca catch me up. All right, next is go to field day. Uh, Field day, uh, the ARRL field day is at uh, the end of June on a weekend, and it is one of, it's probably the largest uh, event on the air and uh, in clubs is to set up a, a, a temporary uh, station uh, somewhat as if it were an emergency and to contact as many amateurs in the United States and Canada and all the territories as you can in 24 hours. So if you wanna operate through the night, you certainly are welcome to. And uh, it's hard to uh, explain it all, but when you get that invite to go out to a field day, uh, don't pass it up because you're going to see uh, how people use their radios, uh, set up antennas, uh, use solar power, and it just goes on and on. And uh, so our field day was kind of impacted by COVID, but uh, so we did field day more as individuals than a group, although I did mine outdoors uh, pretty much as always but uh, uh uh jack do you have any further thing to say about field day it's a lot of fun and a lot of work <laughs> yeah and well, it's not and it's not a contest it's not a contest <laughs> but it's a contest <laughs> but it's a contest <laughs> and our club has uh placed pretty high up in the uh in the rankings Right. I think we've won uh, first place one year and uh, a couple times uh, second place. Right. And if you haven't gotten on the air or if you have some kids, uh, uh, family members, uh, bring them out and uh, uh, you can uh, 
get on the air and and learn the ropes and actually for people that are interested in contesting uh most of them got their first taste of it at field day but uh field day just runs the gamut if you since we're all more attuned to emergencies it can show you how to set up in an emergency because it's somewhat a simulation of an emergency and uh, we want as many people to see field day and uh, get some publicity for amateur radio and uh, and their role in emergency preparedness and support to government entities and so forth. Uh, on the left is uh, our club president, that's the back of his head, and uh, he loves uh, CW and also he loves operating and unless you push him out of the chair, he, he has been known to do the entire field day it basically in one sitting is that does he take any breaks jack no, as long as you keep him uh, supplied with uh, root beer <laughs> and a cookie he's good <laughs> yeah. okay um on the right uh is something i set up uh outside and uh, i love to do field day outside in the field and suffer in the heat and uh uh, so uh, I've been doing that uh, since I was a teenage fan. Well, and uh, it was a great experience as a teenager and uh, it continues to be a great experience. So, uh, so I look forward to field day pretty much every day of the year and it comes around in June. And if you don't like the weather in June, you can participate in a winter field day, uh, which is, uh, um, I think is the last weekend of January. So you can have it cold or hot. You just take your choice. Uh, winter field day is not as big as June field day, uh, but uh, it's getting more and more popular every year. So field day, is a activity that our club supports. And there's also uh, other field days or setups uh, in the county. And uh, so you may have two or three sites to visit. So stay tuned. <laughs> Whoops. Uh, we'll, uh, well, let's, all right well some people would say morris code you know that was from the early days of amateur well marconi used it uh actually uh morris code was used on the telegraph <laughs> system and uh so why would we use it today well because it's awesome and a lot of fun um, uh, uh, Morse code, uh, pretty much everybody's been exposed to it in a movie or whatever, but uh, uh, it's a really kind of a digital mode and it's composed of dots and dashes and uh, uh, a combination of dots and dashes. But don't memorize this chart over here. Uh, you can look at it, but you really want to learn the Morse code by sound. And um, what I, you know, I may not be totally accurate, but I tell people, you know, CW is like half the hobby. <laughs> and and uh, uh, so I encourage everybody to learn Morse code. Not everybody will, but if you think you can, you can. And there's a lot of payback. It's actually, it's a skill and um, that 
the general population doesn't have, but, but you can really get in there. And it's very effective on the HF bands. Um, uh, it's more effective than single sideband for a given power. And uh, uh, it's still very popular. And uh, certainly in contests, um, the whole bands can just be somewhat taken over by Morse code. And uh, so anyway, there's more and more to say about that. Uh, let's see. Uh, K4LIX, are you with us? I may have him locked out, but but anyway, Jim is an expert in Morse code, and he also uh, uh, is a mentor in Morse code, as well as Bob Wesco, and our club has a, a night set aside for Morse code uh, that's on hold right now, but hopefully we'll get back to that at the clubhouse, or maybe we just need to do it at Zoom. So Ryan, what's your impression of Morse code? What's my impression? Yeah. Uh, it looks like it'll be difficult to learn. <laughs> well, um, I learned it as a teenager and I think that was an advantage, but, but I'll just say, if you think you can, you can. And if you have the desire, it does take practice, practice, like learning to play the piano, I imagine. So, but anyway, it's there. I wouldn't rule it out. And it, it it's a lot of, uh, it's a lot of fun. And uh, you can build a kit radio uh, for a Morse code or CW uh, very simply. Um, and there are, uh, actually radios on a very tiny circuit card <laughs> that that aren't the greatest radios, but uh, it doesn't take many parts to create a um, transmitter for Morse code. So anyway, we'll continue. Um, uh, next is get to know your amateur radio neighbors. Lurking in your neighborhood are amateur radio operators. I have one on my street. I, I have two on my street, I think. I used to have four on my street. So, uh, so you may be newly licensed, but there's a ham within a few blocks of you. Uh, you can actually use the website qrz.com. Uh, uh, to uh, get a picture like this, and it will show you little bubbles where the hams are. And um, um, so anyway, uh, obviously you're going to meet a lot of hams at the club, and um, there's hams all over. And Ashley just recently discovered a ham, a new ham. So... Um, you never know when you're going to run into them, but well, to give credit where credit's due, Bots discovered it, told me about it <laughs> from my neighborhood. It's actually, <clears throat> I know his family, but I didn't know he was a ham. Yes. And so that's how that got started. Uh, probably through something like this too, because there's actually two others in my neighborhood. Uh, but I think that one gentleman's moved. Uh, yeah. But. I know of Christopher Lips. His wife and three daughters walk down here all the time and say hi because I'm sitting down here in my ham hut all the time. And I didn't realize he was a yeah. He had just gotten it because he he got quarantined for two weeks, studied and took his test. So awesome. he's like weeks weeks into it right now. Right. Um. Yeah. So. Well, um, so check it out. You may have some right down the street. And um, so gives you something in common with your neighbors. Uh, this isn't mandatory, but, uh, and QSLs 
on paper or as a card aren't as popular as they used to be, but uh, they are still used. And um, uh, you can uh, design your own QSL card or pick a design from a vendor online, uh, cheapqsls.com. Uh, uh, does a great job, or you can design it and print it out on your uh, printer. But anyway, a QSL, there's some lingo, but it's kind of a receipt that you made a contact. And um, uh, in fact, uh, QSL cards have been used to verify that you've made contacts perhaps with uh, various states or worked all states or DXCC. And in the old days, that's, the mail was the only way uh, to handle that. But in the days of the internet, they have alternatives that are electronic and not as cool as the paper card. But you're still gonna receive some cards. You can send one back if you want to. Um, so, um, so uh, uh, I could show my QSL card, but but nevertheless, it has your call sign and uh, some uh, 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 spot for information on the back. So uh, th that would be an option to buy some QSL cards. There you go, right there. Uh, yes, indeed. You can make a QSL card out of a postcard. Right, Phil? That's right. That's an old uh, W4RYZ uh, QSL card. That's the old Miracle Strip Tower. Yeah. Well, if you're interested, you can collect QSL cards, put them on your wall, make a big book out of them. Uh, it's up to you. Uh, next, uh, it's optional, it's not required, but a big part of amateur radio is service. And that's one reason the FCC gives us uh, permission to use the airwaves is that we could or can, uh, well, they really expect us to provide a service. Not every ham is involved in that, but uh, Certainly in Bay County and surrounding area after Hurricane Michael, uh, there became a big uh, uh, interest in uh, amateur radio, uh, uh, assisting and being a mechanism to communicate when the worst happens in uh, hurricanes and and uh, a few cell phones worked, but most of them didn't. And uh, we're fortunate that we have hams in Bay County who have, we've always had some, but the um, a Bay County ARES or Amateur Radio Emergency Service has been formed and um, uh, they, uh, uh, know what to do, and uh, so volunteers uh, can pass some tests and and uh, participate and uh, uh, be available uh, when there's an emergency. Uh, so we'll have a, a talk. If you haven't seen it already, uh, we'll have a talk about Bay County uh, ARES. Uh, there are ARES uh, organizations uh, all over the country and in particular California. Uh, they do assist uh, the uh, fire, uh, <coughs> uh, California fire. Uh, they're in a central part of that. Uh, should they lose their normal way to communicate their alternate is uh, through amateur radio. And also, um, well, on the uh, 
International Space Station, there is amateur radio, and should they lose everything else, they're going to use amateur radio to communicate. All right, next, and we're pretty close to, I believe this is number 21, is participate in a contest. There's just an uh, endless list of contests and um, um, uh, and that's really uh, one thing that you'll hear once you get on HF in particular, uh, you'll hear various contests going on and you won't really understand what they're doing unless you look up the information uh, about the contest. Uh, you can learn a bit by just listening but uh, these guys want to make contacts and uh, the, the better hams uh, do it very efficiently. You don't have to do it efficiently, but the competitive hams uh, learn how to be very efficient on the air. They also uh, tend to improve their station uh, to give them uh, more capability and an advantage in doing contests. So contests, you can get involved in a small way or a big way or somewhere in between. And almost every contest welcomes a newcomer or uh, to jump in there uh, because you'll be a point, you'll be, they'll get credit for you making a contest. Uh, one of the uh, easy ones to do is called the state QSO party, and there are QSO parties for all the states, although some states that don't have a very big population band together and have one QSO party, but um, um, on any given weekend, you're probably going to find a state QSO party underway. Uh, generating a lot of activity on the air. Um, it's not exclusive to HF. Uh, there's also uh, VHF, although maybe we don't do as much about with, with the VHF, UHF, even microwave. It just goes on and on. So, but um, you'll come across this. And um, so um, it's a good way to pick up contacts. And in fact, uh, if you want uh, DXCC, uh, one way is to participate in the DX contest. DXCC is where you get a hundred different entities, uh, roughly countries and uh, and somewhat field days a contest, and then it's not a contest. So you'll you'll get exposed to that one. Uh, and obviously, not all of us did contests, but once you get a taste of it, it may be just what you want to do in amateur radio. And we covered the twenty-one things. Uh, with some detail, uh, everything we talked about could be another talk for a beginner academy. And uh, our goal is to help new hams get started in the hobby. And right now we're using Zoom uh, to be available to new hams. And um, so I'd say we're not all that organized, but we try to set up these talks to come around and it can really be based on what your questions are, uh, uh, getting started in amateur radio, because um, we don't know exactly what you'd like to hear or need to hear. So uh, about half of our sessions are question and answer. And uh, so um, uh, we're available. So with that, I'll wind it up. And um, um, I thank all of you for uh, chiming in and, uh, and helping me out with this presentation. Uh, 
hopefully we'll have it recorded and we can put it on YouTube and make it available to hams that weren't with us tonight. All right. So. Good job. Good well, job, you. Craig. Thanks, Craig. Very good oh, job. You're welcome. Hopefully it didn't go on too long. <laughs> it was oh, pretty good. long. Good job, Greg. Thank you. I thought we lost Jim. <laughs>